So I put this talk together in the hotel yesterday and today, and you're the dry run. <laughs> what I want to do is give a talk that doesn't have any isotopes, any trace element chemistry, any pictures of mineralogy or microprobes or SEM. I think I'm preaching to the choir in this room. My goal is to communicate to you what I think we as geologists need to do more of in our public and our private lives, which is to communicate the critical need for geology, both in terms of academic geology, producing students who go into the workforce, also geology through the lens of public policy and politics. And I hope I deliver that message today. So first I want you to go back in time and I'm gonna start with a question. Where did the industrial revolution begin? Just toss out an answer. Where? England. England. The industrial revolution started in England. Nowhere else, it started in England. And why? Why did it start in England? When we think about the Industrial Revolution as the last significant transition of humans, right? We went from the Stone Age to the Copper Age, to the Bronze Age, to the Iron Age, to now the Technology Age. And the Technology Age is an outgrowth of the Industrial Revolution. And I think it's important for us as geologists to make sure we remind our students, our colleagues, our friends, our politicians of the really special role geology played in how and why and where the Industrial Revolution started. When we look at the photograph here on the slide, what's in the bottom right image? Can anybody guess there what's happening? It's coal. It's coal. It's the combustion of coal in the bottom right. And when you look at that, you see the irreversible reaction of coal carbon plus oxygen equals carbon dioxide, CO2 plus energy. And the energy during that irreversible combustion reaction manifests in what we visually see as heat. And we know that that heat is energy. And it's because of coal and its density and its abundance in England that gave rise to the Industrial Revolution combined with a few other facts. One was that in England at the time, England was the only country on earth where individuals could patent intellectual property. Meaning that if you invented something in your mind and you could make a machine and you could draw that machine, you could get a patent for that machine. And Thomas Newcomen in 1712, he did just that. He patented the steam engine. Now, why did he invent the steam engine? Because the coal mines in that part of England, they were mining below the water table. And the only way they could mine below the water table was to pump the water out so they could mine underground in dry conditions. Without his, ability, with, without his ability to patent, it's likely that the Industrial Revolution would not have taken off the way it did. So intellectual property rights and patent law were important. And then also boredom played a role. When we think about Isaac Newton, the apple falling, that was during a plague that decimated Europe. And Isaac Newton was sent from school to live in the rural part of England where he would be, quote, safe from all of that disease and pestilence. And he had time to be bored. And this will come back to help us. So when we look at a map of England, and you can see here on the right side of your screen, everything here in orange are exposed coal fields. These were coal fields that literally outcropped at the surface. We could see them, you tripped over them. And so it was very easy for early miners to simply extract that coal, toss a match on that coal, lo and behold, you get combustion. 
So this didn't happen randomly. Geology was a critical part of why the Industrial Revolution occurred where it occurred. And we know that among the many outcomes of the Industrial Revolution has been our seemingly insatiable use of coal and the other two fossil fuels, natural gas or methane and oil. And if you look at the data here, for the time period 1775 through 2015, you can see that humans have used about the same quantity of wood worldwide, but our use of coal, natural gas, and oil took off. And with it came a lot of things. So when we look at a fire such as this, I spoke the reaction a few minutes ago, but at the top, this is the reaction for the combustion of wood. Wood is a simple carbohydrate made by photosynthesis. So that carbohydrate, C6H12O6, plus oxygen in Earth's atmosphere, when we spark that reaction, it irreversibly produces carbon dioxide, water, and energy. And that energy we harness. We see the same thing in combustion engine vehicles. So when we put gasoline or petrol in our car, we're putting this compound isooctane, which is a mixture of carbon and hydrogen atoms or hydrocarbons that reacts with oxygen in the air and that yields irreversibly carbon dioxide and water plus lots of energy. And it's the release of that energy that forces a piston up and then the piston falls and we have another burst of energy that forces the piston up and the piston falls. And that's translated to mechanical energy that moves our vehicle. And when we think about humans and what we have accomplished since the Industrial Revolution, which only started a few hundred years ago, this is an image that's only 122 years old, 1900, Easter morning, Fifth Avenue. How is everybody getting around? horse and buggy. At this point in American history, there were almost 200,000 people employed making buggies and harnesses. 200,000 people who got up every day for at that time, a six day work week that typically was 10 to 12 hours a day. And they constructed horse and buggies. And if you look very carefully, you can see one person here for which the buggy has no horse. And over the next 13 years, humans changed dramatically. In only 13 years, Henry Ford ideated mass production of his Model T, followed by Dodge and Chrysler and Chevrolet and Cadillac and others. But in only 13 years, humans went from horse and buggy with roughly a quarter million Americans who made the horses and buggies every day. Well, they didn't make the horses, although I guess on some level, the horses get made, but we made the buggies. And in 13 years, there are no horses, no buggies. They're gone overnight. And everybody who previously worked making buggies, guess what? They were employed in new lines of work. We can look at the invention of tractors. So if you go back a hundred years and you imagine farming without the use of combustion engines, the amount of farm, the amount of wheat that men could thresh, it would take 25 men an entire day to harvest and thresh a ton of grain. Today, we do it in six minutes. Six minutes and it's remote controlled. If anybody ever has the chance to sit in one of these combines up here, inside here, there is a human right in here, and over here is a second human. So in six minutes, those two humans are sitting inside a combine cab, air conditioned, tinted windows, so you don't get skin cancer, satellite radio, and now they're programmed to drive on their own. So the only reason the human is there is to prevent mistakes. So we went from 25 men all day long to six minutes. 
Now, this is what we can think of as inventing prosperity for the masses. So if we look at the two plots here, which cover the time period 1900 until today, all I want you to see here is the image on the top, global population has increased significantly over the last 100 plus years. We went from approximately a billion people at the dawn of the Industrial Revolution to now pushing 8 billion people on planet Earth. And as population has gone up, consumption or use of fossil fuels has gone up. And on the bottom, gross domestic product, which is not a perfect way of measuring economic output, but it's one that's most commonly used, gross domestic product has also increased. If we go back to pre-industrial revolution, everyone was dirt poor, minus the very few, minus the nobility. Everyone else lived a subsistence lifestyle everywhere, all over the world. Since the Industrial Revolution and all of the things that we have ideated, our lives have radically changed. Life expectancy, as shown here, has increased dramatically. I'm 50. During the Industrial Revolution, I would have hit my maximum lifespan. I'd, look, I'd be looking to die, seriously, right? We look at maternal mortality. If we go back to the Industrial Revolution, on average around the world, one out of three to maybe one out of four women died during childbirth. Died during childbirth. Right? There was no anesthesia. There was no cesarean section. Women would die giving birth to children. And we can see also child mortality. On average, around the world, the reason that most women who survived childbirth would continue to give birth to five kids, eight kids, 10 kids, 12 kids, is that half of those kids died before the age of five. And they died from any number of other causes, right? I mentioned poverty. Now I know today without any doubt here in El Paso, across Texas, in Ghana, in Japan, in Michigan, there are people living in poverty. But 300 years ago, everyone lived in poverty, abject poverty, and everyone subsisted day to day to day to day. One out of three women died giving birth to a child. Roughly half of all children died by the age of five. If you live to 50, that was a really good life. We invented the mass production of automobiles, give or take a century ago. And initially there were lots of accidents because we didn't know what we were doing. But notice the data here. If we look at the deaths per 100 million vehicle miles driven, as a function of time over the last 100 years, vehicles are safer, fewer people die per 100 million miles driven. We now have automatic vehicles that are not perfected, but do a pretty good job of telling you when you're drifting out of your lane, bringing you back to focus on driving. We don't have to work as much. We don't. We think we work a lot. And if you're like me with four kids, I make sure my kids know I work way too many hours. But we don't work as much now as we did. 100 years ago, six days was the work week. Six days, 12 hours a day. You were up in the morning. You worked until the sun went down. And then you got up the next morning and you pushed the repeat button. Every single day, minus a few holidays, not two weeks at Christmas, not a three-day July 4th weekend that becomes a five-day weekend. Right? We work less today because we have mechanized a lot of the work that we do. And I mentioned all of those people that 100 years ago made the buggies and the harnesses for horse-drawn carriage. When we look back in the 1800s, think about blacksmiths. Every book you read from the 1600s, 1700s, 1800s, it probably mentions a blacksmith. We put all of them out of work, the collective we, because progress 
was able to make the things in factories that blacksmiths previously made by hand. And that mass production ended the jobs for tens of thousands of people around the world. Those jobs were here, and then those jobs were gone. So changing employment has also been something that humans have adapted to over the last few hundred years. In 1900, well, there were slightly more than 100 Hold on a second. Harness and carriage. I'm not sure why that's playing. That's weird. All right, let me stop that. So in 1900, we have all of these people making carriages and harnesses. They're gone. Look at other things that we don't relate to geology. This is the literacy rate in parts of the Middle East, North Africa, and Southern Europe. Now, what's different between the liter literacy rate on the top versus the bottom? The literacy rate on top is for the population of people who are over the age of 65. The literacy rate on the bottom is the population of people who are high school to college age students. Why is there such a stark difference? Because the geology of these countries, they were blessed with oil and natural gas that they could mine and export and the revenue return completely transformed the educational system in these countries. So today we have whole populations of literate people where two, three, four generations ago, illiteracy was the norm. I mentioned we work less, we do, which means we have more leisure time. We know that men have more leisure time than women. We know why that is, men just don't like to admit it. But we have a lot more free time than we ever did at any point in the past, on average, for most humans. So I'm gonna show you a few slides now just to make sure it's clear where we are, okay? There are two y-axis on these plots. The x-axis is time from the end of the 19th century through the 20th century into the current century. The y-axis on the left is hours of housework per week. Now that's housework. That's not work work outside the house. That's just your subsistence life. And then on the right, is the percentage of households. And when you look at this, I want you to see first access to electricity has gone from roughly 0% of our population had electricity 100 years ago in the United States and other more developed countries. And today, the access to electricity is 100%. Now again, there are challenges, but access to electricity has gone from zero to 100. What do you think the red line indicates? If you have to guess, if the black line is access to electricity, the red line is housework. Think about housework, right? If you imagine living in 1900, when you wake up in the morning, was the room already warm? Uh-uh. Could you pre-program the coffee maker so it was literally in the kitchen, hot, ready for you to enjoy when you got there? Uh-uh. Could you go into the bathroom and flush a toilet and your waste just magically disappeared? Bye-bye. Uh-uh. Could you just turn on the hot water and say, oh, God, this hot water really wakes me up? Uh-uh. But over the last hundred years, we collectively have ideated and invented all of these things that do work for us. The washing machine, the vacuum cleaner, the refrigerator, the microwave, I tell my kids, I can vividly remember 1984, my mother getting our first microwave and all it had was a dial that you could turn. That was it. Today, it wants to know of five sizes of popcorn bags, which size do you have? All you could do 40 years ago was turn it on and off. So this is the result of human ideation, invention, intellectual property, patent, and geology because what fueled all of these inventions, what allows them to work, what provides the energy, the power, historically that has been coal, oil, and natural gas. 
when we look at the relationship between geology and the extraction of fossil fuels and prosperity, we can see here on the left, we've got percent electrified is this left y-axis against year for a number of different countries, Brazil, China, Egypt, India, Mauritius, Sweden, Thailand, United Kingdom, USA, and Vietnam. And what we see is that over the last 100 years, each of these countries went from 0% had electricity to 100%. Now again, not everywhere, but there's 100% access. And we see again, I mentioned it before, with access to electricity, we see economic prosperity, without a doubt. And it's not just economic prosperity. It's not just the fact that there's more capital. It's everything that goes along with economic prosperity. Access to education, access to medicine, reduced domestic violence, gender equity, that despite what we hear in some parts of the United States is much better now than it was historically. So it's not just creation of money, it's everything that correlates with that. And we see this when we look at a variety of indices. This one is called the Human Development Index. And you can see on the y-axis from effectively zero to one, the higher the value of the Human Development Index means that we are consuming energy and we are using that energy so that everyone in society within that country has access to electricity, to medicine, to education, to transportation. And so you can see a very clear correlation between countries that have very low human development indices and their lack of energy consumption. Now, that's a lot of good stuff. Are there negatives? Absolutely, without a doubt. So before I showed you that population and consumption of fossil fuels roughly parallel one another. Well, if we look here, we can see on the top graph that as fossil fuel consumption increased consistently over the last 100 years, so did global average surface temperatures. Right, we can see that global average atmospheric CO2 increased. And for those who accept the science that scientists do, there's a cause effect here that we won't debate here. As you pump more of any particular molecule of gas into the atmosphere, in this case, CO2, it's methane, it's water, we know that that absorbs energy that initially comes from the sun through our solar system and is re-radiated back to space. So higher CO2 means higher temperatures. And we've known this for a long, long time. Everyone has known it. This is a data plot taken from what was then a confidential study done internally by Exxon. And what the Exxon scientists did is they simply used really fundamental chemistry to say, okay, if the y-axis is the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere in parts per million, and the x-axis is year, and we can do experiments in the lab where we know exactly what the temperature increase will be for every aliquot of additional carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, we can predict what the temperature will be at a given carbon dioxide concentration. And the red line is my line. And what it shows you is in the year 2020, the Exxon scientists were spot on. Globally, we hit right about 370 ppm CO2. And now Mauna Kea on Hawaii is above 400. So it's not just the quote, academic ivory tower scientists who figured this out. The oil companies have really smart people that work for them. And this is one of the, duh, if you put more into the atmosphere, the temperatures will rise. And literally the CO2 concentration is exactly what ExxonMobil predicted. Isn't that amazing? 
Funny how facts work. So when we look at primary energy consumption, where are we today? We're dominated by natural gas, oil, and coal. Okay? They make up the vast majority of Earth's primary energy, meaning energy used for everything, not just electrification, but heating, boiling, railroads, transportation, airplanes, etc. And I make this point because a lot of people don't get that. For example, if you follow the news about the quote, Green New Deal, end quote, it really addresses electrification of already electrified components in our lives. Meaning that we have electricity, we're using natural gas and coal to provide that electricity, just swap that out for something else. This is one I show at Michigan. And if you haven't been to this football stadium, you can imagine the size of this football stadium. In this football stadium, each of these fuzzy dots is a human. And there are 115,000 people in that stadium, right? So it's, it's bigger than the Dallas Cowboys stadium by a significant amount, by I think 40,000 more people. Every 40 minutes, every 40 minutes, that football stadium is filled with oil and the world uses it. And then we refill it. And 40 minutes later, we refill it. And 40 minutes later, we refill it. And this is where I want you to have a WTF moment. Like, wow, that's a lot of oil. And it's just over and over and over and over and over. And as a consequence of using that oil, natural gas and coal, we have what here is commonly called the hockey stick or the inverted hockey stick, where you'd have your hands on this part of the hockey stick. And what we see is if we go back to the year 1000, the x-axis is time over the last thousand years. The y-axis is temperature changes of the Earth's atmosphere. We can see that the temperature was relatively constant for almost a thousand years and then whew, went up. And there's no other way to explain it unless you invoke combustion of fossil fuels and the irreversible release of CO2 to the Earth's atmosphere. Nothing else explain it. It just doesn't. And when we look at maps here of surface temperatures, this is an animation over the last 140 years. Red is hot, blue is cold. We see this, we feel this. Right? Whether you believe it or not, El Paso is hotter today than it was 100 years ago. Michigan's warmer today than it was 100 years ago. And these are data that have come from hundreds of groups around the world. And people look at them, and I get some students that say, oh, who cares? It's a little warmer. In Michigan, we'd like a little less snow in the wintertime. That's all right. But these are the impacts that the warming temperatures are having around the world. The Georgia Bulldogs won the NCAA football championship earlier this year. In the state of Georgia right now, their peach crop is declining year over year. And that's because peaches, as with all fruit, if the temperatures in the winter get too warm, they won't yield fruit in the summer. So in Georgia, the farmers are literally experiencing climate change and it's hitting their bank account. Same thing in Michigan. Michigan is having warmer winters, which seems great. Oh, less snow, less ice, yada, yada. But this is fantastic. Uh-uh. In Michigan, it's having horrific effects on the apple crop, on the cherry crop. So just changing the temperature by about one to two degrees, make it a little bit warmer in the wintertime, the fruit no longer grow. And so Georgia, which is the peach state, in about 25 years, peaches won't grow there. They'll move north. Apples, they won't grow. We see the same thing in the bread basket. So if you look here at the bread basket, oh, is it playing on its own? Sure, why it's doing it. When we look at the bread basket here, Nebraska, the corn husker state, you can see the shift here. This is the current bread basket. Over our lifetimes, that will move to Canada. Places in Canada that right now you wouldn't think you can grow wheat or soybeans, 
They're going to move north because the climate is changing. And we see this all over the world. You see it in Russia. You see it in Ukraine. You see it everywhere. So when people ask, what does it matter if temperatures warm by about a couple degrees? That, oops, sorry, that is why it matters because it has real tangible impacts, negative impacts on the growth of crops. So let's move on. How many people have not heard of carbon neutrality? It's in the news all the time. Biden puts it in sentences, it seems like every 11th sentence, right? China talks about carbon neutrality. So let's keep geology in the picture and talk about what is carbon neutrality and what does it require and how can we play a role? Carbon neutrality simply defined is electrify everything. And there's no combustion of any fossil fuel to provide that electricity. So everything is electric and all of that electricity has to come from a renewable energy resource, all right? Now, some of my students at Michigan automatically think, sweet, we all get to drive a Tesla. Wouldn't that be nice? And I think, absolutely, that would be awesome. What would that take if everyone drove a Tesla? Teslas are 100% battery electric vehicles. There's no combustion when you drive a Tesla from point A to point B. But when you look at a Tesla, what does a geologist see? Here's what I see. I see bauxite, which is the ore from which we extract aluminum, and aluminum is used to build part of the body of a Tesla. I see titanium where titanium is alloyed with steel to reduce the mass and increase the strength. We see boron, which also can increase the strength of steel. Copper is how those batteries deliver that electricity or that charge, the power to the motors on the wheels to spin them, and then carbon fiber. When you look at the interior, I see all of the rare earth metals that are used on the interior in magnets and other components. Plastic, that does come from oil, but there are other ways to make plastic. The leather, the leather in Tesla's is synthetic. It's made from algae, silicone, more copper. And then if you lift the car off, underneath you've got about 7,000 batteries. And every one of those batteries we think of as a quote, lithium ion battery, but they're far more complex than simply lithium. They contain lithium, there's aluminum, there can be nickel, there can be cobalt. So there are multiple metals that are used to build those batteries. And there are thousands of them per Tesla. When we look at the copper required to make a Tesla compared to a conventional conv combustion engine vehicle, here's your conventional car you know, give or take 18 to 49 pounds of copper, hybrid electric, plug-in electric, let's go to a battery electric vehicle, 183 pounds of copper. So that's give or take a factor of at least three times more copper in a Tesla than a comparable combustion engine vehicle. And then when we talk about battery electric buses, 814 pounds of copper, right? So round that up, that's a thousand pounds of copper. So when you look at all of these metals, right? Here's a list, right? Graphite, nickel, lithium, copper, and that's copper in the vehicle, not the copper that takes the electricity to the vehicle to charge it. Manganese, cobalt, aluminum, aluminum in the battery, and then aluminum in the vehicle, okay? Then we have the magnets, the rare earth element oxides. I look at all of those metals and I think, where do they come from? And that's where geologists continue to play a role. Geologists were fundamental at figuring out how to find coal when all the coal we tripped over had been mined. And geologists are fundamental now to making sure we can actually find the metals that we need if we imagine a world that is carbon neutral. So when I look at solar panels, I see aluminum, germanium, nickel, tellurium, tin, 
uh, selenium, indium, cadmium, copper, iron, silicon, zinc, silver, lead, gallium, all of those metals go in a solar panel. And there might only be teeny weeny eeny bit, but they have to be in there or else the solar panels don't work. Every commercial scale wind turbine, four tons of copper. It's 4,000 kilograms of copper in every single commercial scale wind turbine, right? Now, for most people, they're on board. They want to mine these metals because we How need them for carbon neutrality. Cheaper energy bills. I don't know why that keeps happening? It's Renewable a me, it, energy. It's a me thing. Yeah, let's do that. See, I told you you were smart. So, for a lot of people, right in the Ann Arbor bubble, and it's a bubble. Trust me. The only people who don't think it's a bubble are the ones who live in the bubble. It's like the Truman Show. Did you ever see that movie? Ann Arbor is literally the Truman Show where everybody's in the bubble and everything is perfect. And then they figure out, oh my God, there are people who don't think exactly like me outside of the bubble. But unlike Truman, they don't actually take a boat and want to get outside. They just like, <laughs> let's get in even more and create more laws to keep other people out. Right? That's how most liberals act in my observation. Anyway, so for most people, everybody's on board, right? Okay, so everybody needs a Tesla. Everybody needs one. We have all these metals. Let's just do it. Here's why most people in your part of the country, Texas, will be on board. Because carbon neutrality, if it requires everything is electric and we have electricity that comes from renewable energy, no natural gas, no oil, it's cheaper to provide electricity with renewable energy than it is with any other coal, oil, or natural gas, any fossil fuel. Like that's just a thing, that's economics. Right. It's not, dear Lord, may natural gas be cheaper than solar. Right. When God woke up one day about 10 years ago, she said, huh, solar's expensive. I'm going to do something about that. And solar and wind, the price has declined by about 90 percent in 10 years. Ideation, ingenuity, intellectual property. Humans adapt. So it's cheaper. Y'all down here in Texas, y'all froze your asses off about a year ago. Not Why? Here. Not here. Not oh, because you're connected outside of the ERCOT grid. Oh, yeah. So y'all are smart. <laughs> All right. If Texas wants to prevent another power outage, it's time to eliminate natural gas because it's natural gas that failed the state of Texas. It wasn't wind turbines, wasn't renewables, no matter what they say in the Capitol in Austin. And if you look at all of the engineering of renewable energy and batteries, without a doubt, you have intuitive theories, oh, they can't be as good, they're better. They are far better at preventing brownouts and blackouts because batteries instantaneously provide power, instantaneously. If you have a natural gas peaker plant and all of a sudden you expect electric rates, ele electricity consumption is gonna go up, and you've got to generate more electricity, it's tens of minutes to several hours before you can provide that electricity. So the demand response is instantaneous. It's just like having a laptop. You close a laptop, power off, open it up, whoop, there it is. You didn't wait half an hour. And this is why when we look at the Midwest, this is one where I don't have to tell you how each of these states voted in 2016 and 2020. All right, and sweet mama, you all should know, they didn't vote for Clinton and they didn't vote for Biden, right? These are states where if you go knock on the doors, are you pro-renewable energy? They say yes. It's only when they get in a crowd that they start to say no. But everybody says yes because it's cheaper and it's better. We see massive wind farms like this one being built off New York now. This is a massive wind farm, wind farm being built by Equinor, formerly Stat Oil of Norway. It's gonna provide a million homes with power 24 seven, 365 when coupled with battery storage. Million homes. And they just float in the ocean like rubber duckies, right? Isn't that amazing? Like that'll be a new song. Anybody have kids, you remember that? Rubber ducky, you're the one. Does that ring a bell? You make bath time, lots of fun. Rubber ducky. I sang that a lot to my four kids. And it'll be wind turbines. 
wind turbines floating in the ocean. Okay, so it's good it automatically transitioned away from that because <clears throat> my voice is a little rough. So this is my house in Michigan. Michigan, not Texas, not California, Michigan. That's my DIY solar field. I did it with some friends and graduate students, fair labor, okay? Although I guess they can't tell their advisor no. But in any event, they came out, we did it, we built it. That's my wife getting out of our Tesla Model Y, best purchase I ever made. Here's what I've never heard my wife say, ever. I've never heard her come home at the end of the day. Do you see what she just did? She just plugged it in. It's a standard 120 outlet in our house. That's all we need to charge our Tesla. The only time we have to use a quick charger is if we plan a trip. That's it. And we can drive from our house to Chicago, one charge. Our house, Cincinnati, one charge. Our house, Pittsburgh, one charge. Okay. Now, everybody here, I'll tell you why you're going to drive a battery electric vehicle. They're way faster than combustion engine vehicles. Right? Doesn't matter what hot rod you have, I'll take you. 3.8 seconds, zero to 60 instantaneous. The torque is instantaneous. I don't have to wait for some stupid pistons to go up and down. The other thing is you never have to go to a gas station. You ever go to a gas station and you, you grab that pump and you think about what people touch when they touch that pump and how disgusting that is? That is ass nasty. We'll just say it. I've never had my wife, Alicia, come in and say, oh my God, Adam, I just, I, I miss going to the gas station. I used to love having to go to the gas station, Adam, and put my card in and wait. And then I would touch the gas pump and I would pray that it was clean, but I would know it's not. And then I would try and figure out how do I wipe my hands. Alicia's never said that to me, right? It's awesome. If you go battery electric, you will never go back. The F-150 Lightning, it'll hook you. Super Bowl this year, every commercial for a vehicle was battery electric, every single one because they're simply superior. This is my basement on the bottom right. I've got six, six Simplify. I don't have stock, but that's the company. Six batteries, lithium phosphorus iron batteries, watertight, waterproof. And my entire house runs off the sun in Michigan, right? In El Paso, sweet mama. I mean, El Paso would be a breeze. But you can do it in Michigan and you can literally DIY it, right? Those solar panels are 420 watt solar panels. They're 200 bucks a pop. It's more expensive to buy the steel and to have the cement truck come out and fill the holes with cement. But you can do this. It really is not rocket science. I promise you, anybody can do it. And once you do it, this is literally a libertarian's wet dream. Fantasy. Fantasy, right? 100% self-sustainable. You are in total control, right? Abbott can't touch your electricity. You control all of it. It's literally, it is the mantra of the Republican Party. Individualism, self-sufficiency, get rid of them all people over there in the Middle East. This is it. It's amazing. So where do we get the medals for all of this? Well, this ain't reality, right? Every year I have some students in Michigan who always think, well, Professor Simon, do you think maybe we could grow the solar panels in the apple orchard? We could have a row of apples and a row of pears, and then maybe we'd have a row of solar panels. And it sounds great. For the love of God, it sounds amazing, but it's not gonna happen. We gotta mine them. We gotta dig them out of the ground. And this is where it becomes political. Because up until this point, every liberal is on board. Tesla's for everybody, solar panels for everybody, batteries for everybody, everybody's on board. But this is where it becomes politicized. And on average, conservatives, they stick with me like, okay, we got to dig a big hole. That's fine with me. But liberals, oh, I don't know. I don't know about that. I'm not sure. I'm not, well, I don't know if we need a Tesla. Well, it's a choice. Right? You can't have your cake and eat it too. We need to dig big holes in the ground that provide that copper. Because when you flip a switch, whether it's turning on a Tesla, whether it's turning on your hot water heater, if everything is electrified behind that electric switch, there's copper wire. And that wire has to run to a source of electricity. 
But this is nothing new for us. We've done it for thousands of years. I teach a resources class where I start the very first lecture with the Old Testament. And in the Old Testament, there are what we call the seven metals of antiquity that you can see here. Gold, copper, silver, tin, lead, iron, and mercury, right? These metals and humans' ability to use them distinguish us from the animal kingdom. Our use of these metals distinguished us from Stone Age and took us to the Copper Age, right? Again, human ideation. We're smart most of the time. Elemental copper, when we found it thousands of years ago in Northern Michigan, there's evidence that Native Americans were using elemental copper as far back as 15,000 years ago, right? You take a tool and you hammer it and it becomes the shape that you want. You look at places like England and there's strong evidence during the Copper Age that finding native copper in places like Great Orme here, where each of these is a man-made cave, this is the origin of in mining what we call drifting, where on the surface, humans saw something that was sort of a greenish color. And when they went into the rock, that greenish color gave way to native copper. And they would drift and build these tunnels that would run for miles into the rock. And they did it drifting to follow the native copper. And the Romans said, well, gee golly, we like that. So the Romans sent legions, and this is an ingot that was mined in England and shipped back to Italy during the Roman Empire, during the Copper Age. Why? Because they made tools with it, right? And they probably had some game rock, paper, scissors. Well, guess what? If my scissors are made of copper, I kill you and I win. So the Romans used the copper and they, what did they do? They dominated the Mediterranean and Northern Africa. And then there probably was some boredom or maybe it was just a happy accident, right? Bob Ross loved happy accidents. So maybe what happened is somebody said, oh, let me see if I can melt this copper. And they figured out that if they added a little bit of tin to the copper, they could melt them together to form what we now call an alloy. And the alloy of copper plus tin is called bronze. And what you're looking at here on the right-hand side, that's basically a kettle underneath is coal. And so you put copper and tin in, that melts, you pour it and you can make tools and tools made of bronze are harder than tools made of copper. So guess what? The Assyrians in modern day Turkey or Anatolia, the Assyrians and the Sumerians were the first to figure this out. And guess what happened? They then took over because bronze is harder than copper, all right? A lot of my students think this is some ancient Sumerian smoke in a bong, but I try and convince them they're blowing air the other way. But it does have that sort of quality to it, doesn't it? You could imagine this at one of your, what is it here they sell in Texas? The CBD and the Delta, Delta 9, Delta 8? The Delta 8, yeah, this would be like the, the Delta 8 haberdashery. Like, and I guarantee you, maybe UTEP students wouldn't do it because they're always in the library, but you never know. So this put places on the map, okay? We figured out what to do with copper. We figured out how to add tin to it. And if you look at the ancient world, you read the Old Testament, each of these symbols here, what is that? Silver, copper, silver, copper, tin, copper. Metals put places on the map. They led to empires that would thrive. And then they also led to empires that would collapse. Copper to bronze. The ancient Greeks started looking for sources of tin. They could find copper, right? The islands off of Greece had abundant copper, but didn't have tin. So they had to find sources of copper either by moving over Europe to England, or they would move here through the Straits of Gibraltar up and around Spain and Portugal. And the Greek name for England was, or was the Cassiterides. Cassiterides for Cassiterite because that's the mineral that they would find. So this is where we are today, right? Humans have found these special places around the world where we sourced those metals of antiquity. And we continue to do that today. We've just expanded. 
We now find these metals all over the world and they build our cities. They've made our cities completely change. This is Shanghai in 1987. This is Shanghai in 2013. What does a geologist see? I see steel. Steel is iron and carbon. Carbon is from, copper, is from coal. I see copper with all the electricity. When we look at our consumption of these metals, we now consume about 400% more iron every single year than we did in 1960. Why? Because we're building. We look at copper, which is the backbone for our built environment. We consume about 300% more copper today than we did in 1960 because it's in everything. 1960, we didn't have laptops and smartphones and projectors. There would have been a blackboard in here. There would probably not have been air conditioning and people would have just, that's the way it was. So the biggest thing that we need in order to achieve carbon neutrality is what I'll show you in the next part of my talk. We used to find metals by tripping over them, right? Not literally tripping, but almost tripping. They outcropped at the surface. We can't do that anymore. Finding deposits is getting harder. So we need more metals, but they're getting harder to find. These are a sequence of images where you'll see the same thing, except I'll populate the middle of the slide. Up at the top is year from 1900 through roughly today. And on the Y axis is depth. So the earth's surface is up here top left. And then we have meters of cover on the left Y axis. And what do you see as a function of time? Over the last 120 years, the ore deposits that we find Copper, gold, tin, silver, rare earth elements, lithium, they're getting deeper and deeper and deeper because we're mining or we have already mined all the shallow ones. So when the shallow deposits are mined out, we have to go deeper. Now, what does that mean, right? If we look globally, most mineral deposits that are discovered, if you look as a function of time, in the 1950s, there was about 45 meters of cover sediment, dirt, regolith, whatever you wanna call it. Today, the average is 178 meters of cover. Now, what does that mean in practical terms? It means we don't trip over these deposits, right? In the case of copper, you can see bottom left 1900 through 2020, right? We still find some copper deposits shallow, but increasingly we're finding them tens to hundreds of meters beneath the surface. And the way that we find them is by using a variety of geophysical tools, sort of our X-ray vision, right? These geophysical tools allow us to see into the subsurface and detect the presence of a given ore body, if it's there or if it's not. And this is just a snapshot here that you can imagine if we could only see the surface of the earth here. With geophysics, we can see into the surface of the earth. And all I want you to take away here is that these colors represent different densities, and those different densities are different rock types. Geologists now use a variety of methods to see into the surface, which means it's gotten more expensive. So if we look at the average cost to find an ore deposit, it has gone up by an order of magnitude in our lifetimes. The average cost by the time a company says, I have a volume of earth with this much metal in it that can be extracted. The average cost is pushing $200 million. And all of that is negative cash flow, right? All of these exploration costs are negative cash flow. Now, as a result of the cost going up and the ore deposits getting deeper, the number of deposits that we find is decreasing year over year. So if you look here from 1900 through 2020, you can see there's some peaks and valleys, but what's critical here is this time period since the last great recession. At a time when we want carbon neutrality, which means we need more metals, we're finding fewer deposits. Now, part of that is that the cost is going up and companies are being much more strategic about how they spend their money. 
it introduces a significant challenge for carbon neutrality because the length of time from when you discover a deposit to when you actually mine it and hold copper in your hand is on average now 16 years. Some metals a little less, some metals a little more. But what does that mean? Why would we care from the time I know there's a volume of earth with this much copper in, in it to when I have that copper? Because this is a busy slide, but all you need to see is that all of the blue here, this is the United Nations. All of the blue here are the countries around the world that have said by 2050, they'll be carbon neutral. That means by 2050, no combustion of coal, no combustion of oil, no combustion of natural gas. Everybody drives an F-150 Lightning. Everybody drives a Tesla. Everything is electric everywhere for everybody. So when we look at this, there's a problem. If on average, it takes 16 years, right? Let's round that up to 20. It's 2022. That means if I found a deposit next year, 2023, it would be close to 2040 before I could hand Antonio some copper on average, okay? So there's a problem if we want to electrify everything. Now, is it possible? Absolutely. And I'll show you one of my greatest examples for everything is possible when people agree. The Empire State Building, if you've ever gone to New York City, you should go to the top. Even though you can go now to One World Trade Center, which is the new trade center and be at 103 stories, there's just something sentimental about the Empire State Building. We built that in 410 days. What's the average length of time do you think to probably build a house in El Paso to pull your permits and get approval for everything and build a house? I bet it's longer than 410 days. In Ann Arbor, it's longer than 410 days, All right? So we built this in 410 days. We went from this to this in 10 years, 10 years. That's all it took. And everybody agreed, maybe not everybody, oh, but everybody agreed, they wanted it. We need a phenomenal amount of copper to achieve carbon neutrality, right? This is a plot here where the black line is the amount of copper produced from primary sources, meaning virgin metal per year. And over the next couple of decades, we have to mine probably double, if not three times the amount of copper than we've mined since the dawn of the copper age. If we don't mine it, we cannot reach carbon neutrality. Like that's just, it, there's, there, you can't do it. It's getting harder. So this is a slide where the y-axis is ore tonnage and the x-axis is the average grade or the percent of copper in a particular ore body. And what we see is that as a function of time, from 1780 to the year 2014, the percent copper in the rocks that we call ore deposits has decreased by an order of magnitude. It's gone from over 10% copper in the rocks that we mine pre-mechanization to now the rocks we can mine them with 0.2 weight percent copper, 0.3 weight percent copper, and we can extract that copper. So it's getting harder to mine and harder to find. When we look at the copper forecast, okay? This is millions of tons on the y-axis. We currently consume every year about 20 million tons of brand new virgin primary copper. If we project out to 2028, what we would need to electrify our fleet, meaning everybody drives electric, everybody. UPS, FedEx, the only transportation that runs on combustion are airplanes, that's it. And, and um, ships. That's it. Everything else is electric. We've got a supply shortage in six to eight years of six million tons. Six million tons is a lot of copper, a lot of copper. We can look at the same thing for lithium. All those lithium ion batteries, there will be a supply shortage, which means carbon neutrality cannot happen if you don't have enough of the metals to build the infrastructure for carbon neutrality. And when you look at this busy slide, I'll just focus you right here on copper, sticking with copper. This is the y-axis is the ratio of supply over demand. When that's below one, it means there's demand is greater than supply. 
So we don't have enough of these metals right now in the pipeline in order to make carbon neutrality happen. Why? Last five minutes, I promise. Why? Because humans have created seemingly impenetrable walls to building minds in the developed world. Humans in more developed countries are on average happy as a clam to build a mine in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Yeah, it bothers them every now and then when somebody says there's child labor. We're happy to mine lithium in Bolivia. And it bothers us every now and then when we hear about some problem down there. But we don't want to build mines here, which is a problem. So this is my favorite example, the Pebble Project in Alaska, right? And I teach a couple of classes on this where we focus on how do you find this? You know, look at the Northern Pacific Ocean. Alaska's massive. It's 10 times the state of Michigan. It's probably three times the state of Texas, give or take. It's a big state. How do you find an ore deposit, right? Well, this is a helicopter flying a geophysical sensor. So over the last 30 years, 30, 30, 0, 30 years, in this part of Alaska right here, mining companies have done lots of geophysical and geologic prospecting. And they converted these x-ray vision, what we see underground at Pebble, they drilled it out. And over the last 30 years, you can see here 1992, surface of the earth is at the top. And all I wanna show you here is how long this takes. From 92, 2004, 2008, 2022, a million feet of drill core have been drilled. So 1200 holes were drilled, a million feet. And it's still called the Pebble Prospect. There's no mine there. Okay. They have put together a mine plan. This is the current surface right now. These are right here, the lines that indicate where the open pit would be located. Everything in red here means high copper concentration. So the highest copper contents are in red and then yellow would be low. So they would start by digging the open pit on the west side because the copper is closer to the surface. So all the money they borrowed, they can start paying that back more quickly. And then as they move towards the eastern side, the pit has to get bigger because the copper is deeper. Now, why should we care? Because this is what Pebble looks like on a global scale. Pebble is a world-class ore body, massive in terms of the amount of copper that it contains, right? It would rank, what, what are we, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. The 12th biggest copper mine on the planet. And if you sum the other metals in this mine, in this, excuse me, this ore body, if you sum copper plus silver plus gold plus molybdenum, it's the biggest ore body on the planet that's been discovered. So I would look at this and think, man, this has got to be Biden's fantasy and the Republicans fantasy, right? It's domestic. It's U.S. owned, made in America. Well, not made in America, but made in the America that we call America. Right. And here it is right for the picking. But it still remains an untapped resource. For many people, for the right reasons. Because when you look at it on a map, this is pebble here, and this is pristine salmon fisheries that have been fished by Native Americans for 15 to 20,000 years. And as much as we can engineer mines so that the risk of a failure is close to zero, it's never zero. So for 30 years, this has been held up. And it's been held up for political reasons, for social reasons and environmental reasons. Geologists know the ore body. We know what's there. A plan has been put forth, but what we cannot get the greater we is the social license for mining. We can't get it. It's gone back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, right? 
Bush Jr. was going to allow mining and then he wasn't. Obama was going to allow mining, then he wasn't. Trump was going to allow mining and then he wasn't. Now Biden, Biden has said he's not going to allow mining. He's going to halt mining, right? And so if you, if you sort of put your thinking cap on and you think, okay, if we want carbon neutrality, if we want energy independence, if that requires metals and we have this domestic resource, do we want to mine that domestic resource in order to tap it for carbon neutrality? And the answer so far has been no. So I'll stop here by saying that when we think about mining, most of the students that I engage with, the, the top phrase resonates with them, stop mining. Like just full stop, stop mining. And then I always turn it around as a question. Well, okay, if we stop mining, we can't have carbon neutrality. It's not just that we can't have Teslas. It's not just that we can't have a few solar panels. If we can't mine, we can't have carbon neutrality, which means the default is business as usual. The default is Russia has half of its economy dependent on exports of natural gas which is among the reasons they invaded the Ukraine. Excuse me, I shouldn't say the, they invaded Ukraine, okay? If we look at the European Union, which over the last 10 years says they want carbon neutrality, but they don't want mining. We see the same thing here. So what, what, I, what I found is the need not to preach to Republicans, to be honest with you, but the need to figure out ways to communicate this to people that are pro-carbon neutrality, that this has to happen, you have to mine. You can't do it without mining. Like there's no way that it can occur. So I've tried to weave this into a lot of my classes in ways, you know, sort of a sly fox, right? Because students come in and the top phrase, it's emphatic, no more mining, stop mining but you've got to. What we have to do is we have to engage in responsible mining. And we see that happening in places like Ghana, not everywhere, but we see that happening increasingly in lesser developed countries around the world where indigenous and local communities are pushing back and they're requiring mining companies to build infrastructure because with mining comes what? comes revenue, comes jobs, it changes the economy, access to medicine, access to healthcare. Right? I did a project a couple of years ago, since you're in the audience, with a group of students who delivered 500 computers to rural schools in the Volta region of Eastern Ghana. 500 schools, computers, so that those children will grow up digitally literate, meaning they'll know how to use computers so they can compete with my kids and Antonio's kids and your kids. So the other night at dinner with, with Jim, who's in the Zoom screen here, we sort of talked about this a bit with one of your alumni, Lewis. You know, and I think geologists have a really critical role that we can play here, but we need to advocate. And we need to advocate for mining that is done sustainably. And thanks for your attention.